This is JSA TV and JSA Podcasts, the newsroom for telecom and data center professionals. I'm Carl Sketchley, and on behalf of the team here at JSA, welcome to our August virtual roundtable. Just a few weeks ago, Hurricane Isaias tore through the Caribbean and the east coast of the United States, triggering tornado outbreaks and severely impacting the lives of everyone in its path. As the numbers go, the hurricane caused over $4.2 billion in insured damages, with a cleanup lasting weeks after. Today, as a timely response for telecom and data center professionals, we will spend the next 45 minutes engaging with top industry thought leaders on the subject of network preparedness for hurricane season. As a little sunshine at your door today, we have provided lunch, or if you chose, a gift card to a local restaurant for the first 100 registrants. So, for those of you who received, please enjoy your JSA lunch while we get started. And a quick reminder, we want to hear from you. So please, go ahead, type your questions into the chat. Time permitting, we will answer them there. And as usual, in the last 15 minutes of the hour, we will take our conversation over to LinkedIn for a chat with our speakers. Search for hashtag JSA virtual roundtables or simply click on the link that will be provided in the chat shortly. Once there, we will cover all the questions our panelists don't get a chance to answer live on camera in the next 45 minutes. If you have a speaker suggestion for next time or simply want to register for upcoming monthly roundtables, visit jsa.net. Our next one will take a look at the ever-evolving face of tech and telecom. That roundtable is September 17th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Check it out and register. Now, let's get started. Today's topic, Tougher Weather Ahead, Tips for Hurricane Season Network Preparedness. For today's chat, we have over 175 registrants joining us. Thank you for your continued support of this series. And thank you to our all-star panelists for dedicating their time for us today. With us, we have Rosa White, CFO, DR Fortress, Mike Lissetra, Vice President, Solutions Architecture at Stream Data Centers, James Ashton, Vice President, Network Operations at 365 Data Centers, and Rudolph Gordon Seymour, Head of International Funding at Telecom Sans Frontières. To guest moderate, please welcome Dennis Lindsay, partner at Cambridge MC. Dennis, thank you for joining us today. Let's jump right in. Rosa, uh, based on where you are and your, yeah. you know, obviously every year is a heightened experience for you. And we're just right. praying that we're prepared. So how, how do you cope with the, you know, uh, uh, the season and what keeps you late at night thinking about what might happen next? It, exactly what Mike actually hit on was the my number one priority is the um, staff, the operations team here. It, this season was coupled with the pandemic. So being on a shift for our operations team, ensuring that, you know, there it, there's no staff being exposed to the pandemic. So we're on special shifts and topping that with planning for the POC and the SOC of who is in charge of the facility during um, the hur Hurricane Douglas this was coming down. So just kind of what keeps me up is making sure that we have enough staff coverage to ensure that who's supposed to be on the site is able to get there. Because as Mike was saying, um, we, you know, the facility was planted in a very specific location, you know, no flood zone. Uh, no, here in Hawaii, no, we're outside of the extreme tsunami zone. So that's just additional forces of nature that, you know, we have to reckon here with in Hawaii. So on top of that, we need to make sure that can my staff make it back to the facility? So someone's here 24 seven, do they have proper backup in order to ensure that if there's a prolonged power outage, are we able to support the customers that are coming in for whatever reason? Um, and as James was saying, power is key. We here in Hawaii, we've always um, had seven days of um, um, fuel on site, just in the event that streets closing or whatnot, we need to make sure that those generators are properly maintained and that we have sufficient fuel ready to go. So 
Um, I think what James and Mike have said is no different than in Hawaii, other than the fact that if we were to be impacted by a hurricane or tropical cyclone or whatnot, we just have to deal with a prolonged ability to sustain ourselves on an island versus being able to get resources a lot more um, readily through just in, you know neighboring states. Okay, thank you. And I think for you, Rudolph, I'm, I'm listening to this answer keenly because it's not the case that you're waiting for a season for something to happen. <laughs> you're sitting on the edge of your bank, ready to don on the the cape with the S on to, to help on. Is that okay? Yeah, we well, we kind. I guess we we kind of wait. Um, it's it's a potentially a very busy time for Telecom Sans Frontier um, because it also uh, coincides with the typhoon season in Asia. Mm. Um, so um, that keeps us um, um, very busy um, and we just have to make sure that our regional offices, and um, we, we do have a regional office in Mexico and, and one in Thailand, we have to make sure they're just at full operational um, readiness. Um, and we also, um, historically, we've subscribed to a, a system um, called GDAX, uh, which is a disaster alerts and coordination system. Um, and basically, this is a, a, a kind of a cooperation framework between the United Nations and the European Commission um, and includes disaster managers worldwide to basically improve alerts, uh, information exchange, um, uh, coordination in the first phase after a major um, disaster um, and that just means that we can really closely monitor any situation we can actually track um, the path of um, any hurricane any typhoon um, and in some instances um, we will actually send engineering teams out uh, before the hurricane hits um, into that region um, so we will be um, first on the ground and uh, and TSF um, has a reputation for being probably one of the fastest responding NGOs in the world. Okay excellent so at this time of year what do your customers want more from you than anything else? Mike I'll, go, I'll give that one to Mike. Yeah certainly so you know preparing for hurricanes uh, the top priority for customers communication from us, right? They want to know that we are prepared and that we are focused on providing uh, the support that we've agreed to, so, to provide to them. Um, so communication, 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 uh, clear, concise, timely communication, right? And that can be t having um, your EOPs able to share, right? If they were to request that. Um, having your staff know the EOPs like the back of their hand, that definitely helps. Um, but then having, you know, the clear portal or, or conduit for them to be able to even view real-time status of your facilities. Um, that is a product that Stream Data Centers is working on right now of deploying, where we would be able to provide that transparency to customers um, that they would be able to see that all the facilities are humming along without any issues and see that, you know, power is stable, uh, generators don't have any issues, things like that. Okay, thank you. And, and the same to Rosa, what, what's your take on that? Yeah, communication is definitely um, key for our customers. Just um, what we, we have a certain, a certain communication kind of template for our customers. So as soon as we hit any sort of watch or warning, we start communicating um, standardized messages that go out and really just kind of educate not our, our, just our customers, but all the um, points of contact and are reaching out in addition, what we um, always do is, you know, obviously a week ahead, sometimes uh, 48 hours, we make sure that the employees are taken care of. We make sure that the staff goes through, we have checklists for the facility, for admin, um, and for the IT. And so just going through those standard checklists, and I know it sounds like common sense, but just every once in a while we're going through that list and you're like, uh -huh, that's right, that person left, so we needed to make sure that that got done. So it's just having the, I guess, the consistency and the practices to, yeah, maintenance has been done, that's just been checked off, but just the little details, ensuring that those have been taken care of 
and being able to communicate that to the customers knowing that we're ready, I think is really key. Okay. Just ensure they trust that we're ready to go. Okay, cool. And, and, the, and the same too, James. So is there a demand from the customers uh, prompting you before the season for specific things? Or is it the case that you just need to make sure that you're telling them proactively that you're ready? Um, you know, I think that uh, there's always a certain number of customers that are going to come to you with requests, with, with demands in some cases, or with requirements. And, and oftentimes um, legislated requirements, you know, things that if you're in the medical industry or the financial industry, they have some things that they have to do. Um, so, so, you know, you always get some of that. Um, I think though the vast majority uh, to, to, to Rosa and, and Mike's point is um, communication. Uh, we watch these sorts of things. And in a lot of cases, we find that, you know, a customer might not actually know that there's a storm coming or, you know, you know, they're not, they're not necessarily, they're busy doing their thing. They're not necessarily watching us do our thing. And uh, it's important for us to let them know that we are. Um, to let them know what's happening and what might affect them, uh, in some cases, at their offices. Um, but, you know, I, I kind of put it all down to peace of mind. In, in my mind, what the customer expects from us is peace of mind. They, they don't want to have to think about, uh, you know, our portion of their IT infrastructure. They just want, they just want to have confidence that it's going to work. And, and in a lot of cases, that's giving them tours of the facility, giving their staff tours of the facility, showing them, um, it, I mean, sometimes uh, little things that might not make a large difference, but it, it, lets, it shows them that you know, you're paying attention to details um, and it's interesting to them. And if, if you can keep them engaged uh, and, and paying attention to your communications and keep communicating with them about what you're doing and what's going on, um, you know, for most customers, that, that covers what they're looking for. Uh, as I said, there are always those that have uh, additional needs that, you know, you may have to meet or you may have to provide proof that you have met um, because of various certifications or et cetera that they're carrying as well. Um, so, you know, those are, those tend to be one-off situations um, and, and you have to be ready to deal with those as well. Um, another thing that, you know, I know that uh, is very helpful is, um, during the hurricane season, we always try to make sure that people are available to talk to the customers so that they don't call in and get a, and get a call queue or something. If they call in and they're, and they're nervous and they have a question, they have a human to talk to uh, nearly immediately. Um, and, and that actually seems to make a, a fairly large difference. You know, they, they just, they just want to know that things are going to be okay from a storm point of view and that they don't necessarily have to worry about things as much. Okay, thank you. And, yeah, and as you say, I think someone did say, I, I have experience in operations for a major oil and gas company around Houston. And I remember very well the preparations one had to go through when you know something horrible was going to happen. And then you unexpected things happen, and then you have to pivot. Um, but I've also got some connections in the Caribbean. And I remember sitting in St. Lucia in 2007 when Hurricane Dean went by. And it was an adventure. Uh, and I felt that very keenly, though I had young kids, and that, that had a different mindset to me than being in operations, having to make sure that infrastructure stayed up. So, so my next question is to, is to Rudolph, really, because um, to me, this is, will colour what we're saying in, in a certain way. So what has been the most adventurous thing that your teams have had to do, let's say in the typhoon season? You know, what's the most adventurous thing that has happened they have to do with? <laughs> Well, I think um, our, our, our engineering teams would probably, the, the teams that actually get deployed um, at very short notice, sometimes notice of hours, um, and get sent out anywhere in the world, um, they would probably say every deployment is an adventure um, because they don't know what they're being deployed into. Um, they have to make very quick assessments of the situation at hand um, and bear in mind we have to make the assumption that maybe there won't be any power available on the ground so we have to have contingency for that um, they also have to you know feed and shelter themselves um, as well as dealing and looking after the affected 
populations. So I think it's probably difficult to take one example out of, you know, over 140 deployments. Um, but I guess, you know, one that's probably kind of fresher in people's minds would be um, Hurricane Dorian um, uh, in 2019. Um, and that kind of provided a unique set of challenges um, to TSF because not only was it um, probably one of the fiercest um, hurricanes um, on memory, um, it also required some fairly logistical challenges. Um, and we set up five calling operations um, across four of the islands. Um, and the logistics of just uh, traveling between islands was difficult. It, it, it was rough weather. Um, there was a risk of injury to the personnel who were actually responding. Um, uh, the team was sleeping on, you know, the floor of a, of a supermarket. Um, you know, so we have to kind of adapt, basically, to every mission. And every mission's unique. Um, and I think that's probably what our forte is. Okay, so, of course, once it's done and dusted and everybody's okay, it's an adventure. At the time, it probably didn't feel too great. No. <laughs> and kind of to, to pick up on, on the... On, on, on before in terms I think the common theme of what do what do your customers want and I know you didn't ask me that because I don't actually have customers per se but I can replace customers with partners or end users and it's kind of the same thing because it really comes down to you know communication um, and we have to provide um, you know kind of we try to provide real-time mission updates to our partners our partners who who fund us um, we, we will provide regular reports, we will provide content and imagery for social media updates um, and social media campaigns. So that's really important to us. And we like to try and make sure our partners get updates before the rest of the world. So that's the, that's the kind of challenge there. And from an end user perspective, um, I think when they see a TSF team on the ground, you know, their expectation and they see that TSF logo, their expectation is very much, I am going to be able to make a call to my loved one. You know, that's their expectation. And that's what we do. Well, thank you very much. And that's an excellent KPI. It, it brings life to the situation rather than, you know, uh, somebody can pick up the phone in an office and make a call, is I can talk to my loved one. No, thank you, that's great. So Mike, this is going to be a difficult one for you to follow then. So given that adventurous uh, response, I know that you've had some adventures yourself, especially during hurricanes. So what has been the most adventurous thing that you've had, had to do and cope with uh, in your professional life during, during these sort of seasons? Yep. So, you know, one hurricane that I did live through was the Hurricane Sandy um, event in New York City in 2012. Um, the employer I was at at that point actually had a building in lower Manhattan that was built in a flood zone. So what do they do when it's built in a flood zone? You design the building to flood. Only problem when the building's flooded, you can't get anyone in or out of it. So they had to put all of the staff in the building. So great, um, we had plenty of, of fuel, uh, things like that, but now you have to worry about, do I have enough food? Do I have enough water? How do I maintain hygiene um, amongst the staff? And these are all additional aspects that typically don't get thought of um, when you're planning a new site, right? Everyone thinks how big is your, your fuel tank? Uh, how many power feeds do I have? How much battery backup? Um, but that's what will get you. Um, we actually had another site at that employer that almost had to get shut down because the sanitary sewer system was break, um, had a lift pump and the lift pump lost power. So if the holding tank filled up, we had, would have had to evacuate the building. That would have been you know, quite the uh, intricate, I guess, situation where we have a building that's running seven days straight on, on gens and it's really the sanitary system that is now the, the thorn in our side. Uh, and then, right, so, so those were, were two very uh, interesting and adventurous uh, scenarios that I had, had to deal with. And those are the things that you have to plan for, right? We had uh, at the one site, at both sites, right, um, redundant fuel filters. So we can swap the fuel filters on the fly but we didn't have redundant air filters and the air filters actually were the, the components that started to clog up after a few days of continuous operation. 
So it's having those consumables on site that you maybe necessarily wouldn't plan to have on site um, that, that will get you through a extended runtime event. In this case, it was seven days straight. Wow, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, Rosa, you, you saw. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say I have no exciting adventurous stories as, <laughs> as everyone's been talking about. I mean, for us, the, the, again, there's, it, it's kind of interesting, you know, the media makes such a big deal about hurricanes in Hawaii, but realistically, you know, we've been hit twice uh, since 1959. And just this one in the beginning of the hurricane season, Douglas, was a little bit adventurous for us in the sense that, again, we were already on a pandemic staffing schedule. So talked with planning for this, it just took a lot more time and coordination. And as James was saying, we actually contacted all our customers, just gave them that personal touch of, I know that Hawaii keeps getting hit with all of these, you know, challenges per se, but we, we wanted to call and just touch base with each of our customers know that you know we're ready to go or, or, or whatnot um, the more adventurous was you know uh, um, my kids enjoying the best surf day that they had in a long time so um, yeah we we uh, were I'm very fortunate that the facility is in a, a non-extreme uh, tsunami zone a non-flooding area and that's um, I'm so thankful for that because you still have to plan for the worst but know that we're in the best location we can be, and that we are as prepared as we can be. So no exciting or adventurous stories, Dennis, that I can share, unfortunately. Uh, well, I like the surfing story, but thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so James, yourself. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I want to, uh, to definitely comment on, on Mike's, um, you know, the, the taking care of your staff and your staff's family, um, you know, not so much as a story, but there, there is a lot of work that has to go into that, making sure that, you know, you have facilities on site to handle um, the, the people that you have to take care of in order to have an operational staff on site. Uh, and sometimes that's, you know, somebody's dog. Um, you know, sometimes that's just necessary. Um, I've actually found it interesting that sometimes in high-rise buildings, that's actually easier, which normally data centers in high-rise buildings are anything but easy. Uh, but, uh, you know, most high-rise buildings nowadays have gyms, they have showers, they have, you know, enlarged bathrooms, they have extra space in hallways and stuff like that. So, so sometimes that's actually beneficial, uh, being in a high-rise. Um, as far as interesting stories, uh, that, for me, all the interesting ones keep coming back to power. Um, I can remember a couple of years ago in Tampa, I had a, a, an event where, you know, in the middle of a hurricane, uh, we had a main breaker. Uh, I guess I say middle of a hurricane, middle of, a, uh, of the edge of a hurricane. Uh, we had a main breaker start getting really hot. And so uh, a panel was about to go down uh, that was going to take down, uh, I think, like six air conditioning units. And um, we, you know, we build everything with bolt through panels. So we had to back feed the panel from a 13,800 volt substation um, through a breaker sitting on the floor so that we could power the panel without taking the, the main breaker okay. offline, remove the breaker, replace the breaker, and then transfer the power back to the replaced breaker. Um, all in the middle of a storm with no electrician on site. Um, yeah, that was, that was interesting. Um, I think that's, that's probably the most interesting one I can think of. Uh, I have a few others, but uh, that one, um, the only other one I can think of is standing next to a, 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 an electrical engineering mechanic or an EE mechanic while he was working on the main input for a 13,800 uh, volt uh, two megawatt substation with a, with a two by four, uh, prepared to pry him away from it if uh, anything shorted through him. Oh my gosh. So, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't expect the answer. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, it all seemed to come down to power. So those, those are yeah, the interesting yeah. ones. Yeah. 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 Okay, so what are the most exciting technical developments that your teams are currently involved with that will enable you to improve what you do? So I think I will start off with Rudolph on that one. That will be an interesting one. So what well, do you hopefully. <laughs> 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 I 
I mean, um, well, I mean, we, we, you know, TSF, uh, certainly the engineering department, um, um, have a great history of uh, uh, taking off the shelf products and hardware, ripping it apart um, and making it good for the field. Um, so I, I often go in the office and uh, the place is just uh, littered with uh, equipment and I do wonder how they actually put it back together sometimes. But um, so we've got a pretty good history in kind of adapting technology. Um, and obviously we, we rely pretty heavily um, on satellite. Um, and that really, uh, the challenge there is really to be able to uh, send as much data, make as many calls through the smallest pipe possible. Um, so that's the, tra that's the challenge. So network traffic management um, is absolutely key. Um, we do a lot of uh, reverse engineering um, for uh, quality of service uh, for the voice side, um, which kind of supports our, our calling operations as well. Um, and then we also um, kind of post event, and uh, we, we will leave um, equipment um, on site. And we've done this, we did that for, for the hurricane in the Bahamas. Um, and we would actually train um, teams, local responders on the ground in order to use that equipment. So the response is even quicker. So that's something we also develop as part of the, the strategy. Okay, thank you, Rudolph. I mean, you broke up a little bit for me, but I think I got most of what you said there. Thank you very much. Okay. So, uh, the same question to Rosa this time. Well, for us, um, one of the things that we're trying to do is, you know, we have been an edge data center forever, just based on our geographic uh, location. But what we have seen, um, is especially recent, is just the building demand to have access to the big major public clouds. I mean, they're just, we, with a million eyeballs here in Hawaii, uh, mostly on the island of Oahu, just the public clouds just can't justify uh, creating a node in Hawaii. So what we're trying to do now, and uh, we are probably going to launch within the next few weeks, is actually just the direct connections to a lot of these public clouds. So. It will, it will be a major differentiator for DR Fortress um, in order for our customers to just be able to, from our facility, be able to have a, a single direct connection. So again, it's, it's, the demand has been just time being able to get to those. The latency, there's only so much you can do with latency across the Pacific. And so with having direct connections and with, with having a really solid network design that we're working with a lot of the public cloud providers being able to put that together has is really exciting for us because it's just been this constant need for our customers that we haven't been able to um, meet for them or they're just it's the demand is now here i'm not sure if it was pandemic related or just the right time at the right place so we're putting that together so that's really exciting i know for uh, you know, for 365 or for stream, it's probably like, yeah, duh, no problem. But here in Hawaii, where there is no dark fiber available um, between the cable landing stations and the data centers, uh, you don't have reliable um, connectivity at all times. So, so we're, us trying to set this up will really be a, a, just a key product for our customers. So I'm really excited about that. Okay, thank you, Rosa. So, so for you, Mike, I suppose uh, what, what I, well, what people are usually calling cloud network exchanges in, from data centers into the public cloud, is that something that you're dabbling with in terms of product development or is there any other area that's been accelerated by these times for you and your organization? Sure. So, so Stream, you know, our vision and kind of where we see our value proposition is not as an edge or connectivity um, solution to customers. It's more of a, a replacement for your existing enterprise on-prem um, or for immediate capacity to some of the hyperscalers, right? So the markets that we've chosen selectively um, to, to deploy our new hyperscale product in are Chicago, Phoenix, and Dallas. And we have uh, existing properties in Minnesota, Houston, San Antonio. Um, so really the, the product development life cycle, again, not, focused on the interconnection, but we do have to keep that at top of mind 
when we are selecting a site because we need to make sure that we're, we're close to the fiber routes. As Rosa pointed out, we probably don't have as much of a challenge finding fiber routes in Dallas, Phoenix, and Chicago um, as she does in Hawaii. So, you know, we are grateful for that. Um, but, you know, looking at, at our typical customer where we're looking to, to lease, you know, multi megawatts to a uh, few hundred kilowatts, et cetera, um, we're trying to appease all of those demands. And it's very challenging to build one product that is going to appease an enterprise that's looking for 300 kilowatts versus a hyperscaler that's looking for, you know, three, five megawatts at a, at a time. Um, so that's you know, really my role is to take all this feedback and make sure that we are developing our stream data center spec product to be flexible enough that we can meet the demands of the enterprises while still being competitive with the other providers uh, to meet the, the demands of the hyperscalers. Um, I'm especially excited our Phoenix campus, 350 megawatts of redundant power. So we'll have plenty of lessons to be learned there. Um, as we iterate on our design and uh, you know definitely looking forward to seeing what's out there um, also you know we've learned a lot as stream um, doing 250 megawatts so far mostly built to suit for for enterprises so we've taken a lot of those lessons learned we understand the enterprise customer intently um, and we're, we're looking to also um, support the hyperscaler as well too Thank you, Owe. So, so James, is, is that similar to you or is there some aspect of development that you're gravitating to based on customer demand? I, I think that Mike and, and Rosa and I are all largely in the same state. Uh, you know, the, really there, there isn't a lot of new technology uh, directly that uh, I'm employing. Um, it's it's largely how we're using, uh, in our case, existing technology, or the combinations of technology, or or to what Rudolph was actually saying, the repurposing and and maybe slight modification of technology to fit our needs a little bit better than it did out of the box. Um, you know, in a lot of cases, uh, you know, we're interested in okay, um, you know, particular to 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 the hurricanes, how how can we provide additional layers of redundancy to customers? Um, you know, the, ne this, the, the networking world, the facilities world, the power world, most of the building blocks have been there for quite some time. Now maybe somebody is, has made something two to 5% more efficient or something over the years, but largely the building blocks are there. It's a matter of, okay, um, well, can I find a way to not take up any more floor space and not create any more floor loading, but add an extra 15 minutes of runtime to my UPS? Can I, you know, hey, is the new generator um, going to be able to run for an extra four hours on the same amount of fuel? Um, you know, am, am I going to be able to, um, you know, is the new DWDM system from the standpoint of network going to be able to handle? Um, you know, providing redundant connectivity from, you know, from this location to the other location that the customer needs. Um, and how many more customers can I carry on that and still maintain that level of redundancy? Um, and, and when do I need to augment? So, you know, in my mind, a, a lot of what we're doing is just, um, you know, to, to Rose's problem, every location has a, has a specific set of issues. Um, Rosa, you were talking about, you know, not having easy fiber availability. Well, you know, you, you, we're not really talking about new technology. We're just talking about getting access to existing technology or, or, or maybe, maybe digging a trench in the ground and laying in new fiber. Um, and, and Mike, you know, you, you were speaking of, um, you know, different, different uh, locations. I think it was Dallas uh, that had some, some specific issues. And, and, you know, every facility and every location has a specific subset of problems you need to deal with and, and a lot of times there isn't a ready-made solution so uh, you know as as a network and facilities team we kind of need to sometimes roll our own um, based on the technology that's out there so i, I find that the, the combinations of technology is, is more uh what i find interesting and it and has helped us a lot more in the long term um you know whether it be network facilities power air conditioning etc Okay, if we carry that theme on for a bit, which is a kind of an extension of what Rudolph said, so if you're kind of reimagining 
uh, existing activity and recombining them in brand new ways for different settings, different outcomes in terms of new innovation. Mm -hmm. Is any of that happening around the context of the need to improve what you're doing in a hurricane season or accelerating because of the pandemic? Uh, is there any kind of new uh, innovations used in these new type, uh, a kind of fourth industrial revolution type technologies like um, AI, or, or those sort of things. Is there any of that that's uh, on your plate now that you're accelerating because you need to go faster to deploy them? And if I leave that with James first to begin with, and then we'll yeah. circle around. Um, I don't know as I, I don't know as hurricane uh, oh. is changing a whole lot uh, simply because we we've all been here for a while and hurricanes have been something that we've been concerned about for ever. Um, it, certainly, uh, the the pandemic has has made some changes. Um, you know, we've, we've seen a lot, I mean, just in, in the, the connectivity issue, you know, historically our customers anyway, um, we've offered them connectivity to their office via, um, you know, uh, fiber connections or copper connections, different types of, of telecom technologies, VPN over their existing internet connection, you know, however, but, but at this point with everybody distributed and working from home, we, we're seeing a lot of people have other types of, of issues, you know, the variable latency across the internet, um, you know, uh, not, you know, living in, in areas that don't have great internet, uh, don't have stable internet, um, maintaining our, our internet availability at our facilities. Um, and, and yes, like uh, from, from an AI point of view in particular, um, you know, we've seen a, a lot more SD-WAN deployments out there, um, and, and a lot of people seem to be reaching for that um, mm -hmm. now that people have kind of started to stabilize their goals uh, post the, the initial uh, pandemic outbreak. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of, of higher level uh, work in some of the, in some of the, the SD-WAN platforms out there where, where they have um, a lot of um, automation or, or AI to an extent, um, figuring out pathing, figuring out, you know, hey, this application is latency sensitive, so we'll send it the low, the low bandwidth, low latency path. This application is not, we'll send it the high bandwidth, high latency path. You know, this can go via satellite, this can't. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, there's, and there's a lot of uh, intelligence there. With the number of applications we use and uh, while a lot of stuff seems to be kind of converging on um, on web-based uh, stuff, um, you know, communication protocols and such, uh, you know, one application over a website versus another application over over a web protocol um, perform very differently, and and it takes quite a lot of technology to figure out how that works. So you know, that's that's one example. Um, you know, from a facilities point of view, from a data center point of view, I'm not sure, uh, you know, the, the anything that helps us uh, operate with fewer staff members on site um, so that we can kind of keep the, the people on site as slim as possible, let people stay at home with their families, prevent as much travel as possible, uh, it, you know, is, is something we're certainly looking into. Um, and, uh, you know, we've improved uh, a lot of our security door controls and stuff like that with, with um, systems that require less hands-on, uh, systems that are more reliable, um, you know, uh, th those sorts of things seem to be uh, the direction that things have been going in the last couple months. Okay, thank you very much. So, so Mike, is that the same for you or is, there, is it less about, you know, SD, SDN or SD WAN and that new stuff and is as and is it more about what you can do more efficiently around your operations? Or where do you stand with that in terms of innovation? Sure. So you know for, for innovation, right, we we will definitely investigate the use of things like machine learning to help us with predictive maintenance in the future. Something that we're just in the data gathering phases of, right? You, you need good data to make good decisions. Um, but I think most interesting to myself and I think the industry too is just the um, increase in demand for compute due to these technologies being so easy to leverage by end users, right? And you know that's, that's going to be what drives the demand um, into other you know, 
co-location facilities, on-prem uh, hyperscalers, the cloud, et cetera. Um, you know, the, the nerd in me, I, I'm especially excited. Uh, you look at what Google's doing, where they're aligning um, non-time critical workloads with renewable energy supply, right? I think that kind of effective use of capacity is really where us as data center operators in the future um, can provide a benefit to our customers that don't have those resources at their hands to you know, either get um, renewable energy um, or operate their facilities in a manner that would align um, with that supply. Thank you, thank you, Mike. So, uh, Rosa, can I just ask for your brief recount on that? And also, Rudolph, sure. can you kick in and then we'll, we'll segue into Cal. Yeah, so Rosa? Sure, sure, absolutely. Well, first of all, the CFO in me is uh, just really excited about anything that James was talking about. Improvements in equipment efficiency and PUE, that always goes down to the bottom line and helps with EBITDA. So. Um, any sort of innovation um, where you are improving the operational efficiencies of the facility um, makes just CFOs days. <laughs> so that's, uh, an, you know, absolutely critical. And in our facility, we're constantly look, looking for that. Um, you can look around the country and look at power costs. Um, and when we're sitting here in Hawaii with 21 to 24 cents per kilowatt hour um, compared to other parts of the country, um, just any innovation in um, the power and efficiencies for both cooling um, and PUE are absolutely critical for the facility. I mean, anywhere it is, but just more so with in areas where the cost of power is just so, so astronomically high. And in order to stay competitive, we need to make sure that we implement those. So innovation as far as facility-wise, that's what we're always looking into. Thank you, Ben. Uh, so that, I think that's really critical for most data centers. Thank you. And the last words, Rudolf, innovation in your areas, reimagining what you're already doing briefly. Um, well, I think, um, I mean, we've, we've, uh, if we relate it to COVID first, I think what we've had to do is um, have a, a shift in some of our long-term programs. So we, we run a lot of long-term um, educational programs, and we basically had to move that out of the classroom um, to uh, virtual um, education systems. So um, that's probably been one of the kind of immediate challenges, I would say, of COVID to be able to shift that and to continue providing those services. Um, I think um, in general, innovation-wise, we utilize satellite a lot. And, you know, now we're seeing like a proliferation of um, low orbit satellite for broadband services. Uh, which for us would be great because, um, you know, this provides cheaper, um, faster, uh, kind of more reliable method of communication, especially for an emergency deployment. So that's something we're looking into um, a lot right now. Thank you very much. And thank you, everybody. That was fantastic. I really enjoyed that conversation. The fact that I'm over here in England having the conversation with you shows that <laughs> communications is working very well. And thank you very much, Cal, for inviting me and, and JSA. Back to Cal. Yes, thank you, everyone, for your tips for hurricane season network preparedness. Uh, this was an amazing discussion. Uh, thank you so much, Dennis, uh, partner at Cambridge MC, for keeping us on point today. And as well, thank you to all our all-star panelists, uh, Rosa White, DR Fortress, Mike Lasitra, Stream Data Centers, James Ashton, 365 Data Centers, Rudolph Gordon Seymour, Telecom Sans Frontier. Um, just a quick reminder, our speakers are staying on for the remainder of the lunch hour to answer any more of your questions on LinkedIn. Uh, you can search for hashtag JC Virtual Roundtables or to make it a lot easier on yourself, just click the direct link in the chat box to continue the Q&A. And viewers, if you were one of our first 100 registrants, we hope you enjoyed your lunch. Go ahead and visit us at jsa.net to register for upcoming JSA virtual roundtables, including our next one on September 17th, which will examine diversity and the ever-evolving face of tech and telecom. That's a wrap. Look out for the playback of today's roundtable coming soon to JSA TV and JSA podcasts on YouTube, iTunes, iHeart, Spotify, and more. In the meantime, see you over on LinkedIn. Happy networking.